Hi everyone and welcome, this is the Apostate Prophet. I hope you're having a great day. There is an age-old Islamic claim that Muhammad was prophesied in the Bible, or the Torah and the Gospel. Now you could say, what is it to you, an irreligious person, what the Bible says? And I could then say, who are you to question what I can care about? But I'm not a jerk, and neither are you. It's true, to an irreligious person like me, it could be quite meaningless whether Muhammad is mentioned in the holy books of Jews and Christians or not. But it is not meaningless. On the contrary, it is of extremely big importance. The claim that Muhammad can be found in the Bible is a core claim of Islam, directly found in the Quran. It has to be true for Islam to be true and for Muhammad's prophethood to make sense. If this claim is false, then that undermines Islam's credibility and destroys Islam completely. The Quran asserts that the Torah and the Gospel mention Muhammad. It says, those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find written in what they have of the Torah and the Gospel. In Quran chapter 7 verse 157. In another verse, it asserts that Jesus told the people that Muhammad would come. And remember when Jesus, son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, indeed I am the messenger of Allah, to you confirming the Torah, which came before me, and bringing good news of a messenger who will come after me, whose name will be Ahmed. Quran chapter 61 verse 6. <laughs> that doesn't sound at all like something that the Bible would say. It rather sounds like many of those made up stories in the Quran. The author of these verses also seemingly completely misunderstands biblical history. It depicts a history where Jesus comes as somebody who confirms a book that came before him, which is the Torah, which was revealed to Moses. But that's not how it works. The Torah is just a part of the Old Testament, assumed to be written by Moses, whereas the Old Testament consists of so many more books that are all a fundamental part of Judaism and Christianity. They are very crucial. But anyway, we know, Islam is not very bright. Ahmed is supposed to be another name for Muhammad, both meaning praised or most praised or thanked or most thanked. So the Quran asserts that the Torah, the Gospel, and Jesus told people about the future coming of Muhammad. The Torah is the collection of the five books of Moses. Muslims believe that it was originally revealed by Allah to Moses, but later corrupted by the Jews. But the Quran verse clearly says that they will find Muhammad mentioned in the Torah that they have, in Muhammad's time, which is the same one available today. The Gospel is not a book that actually exists. Muslims believe that it was originally revealed by Allah to Jesus, but then it went lost. So Allah failed. And Christians wrote their own corrupted Gospel. Interestingly, the Quran verse clearly says that they will find Muhammad mentioned in the Gospel that they have. It could therefore only refer to the book that Christians currently have. In Muhammad's time and culture, Gospel in Arabic Injil, from Syriac Evangelion, which comes from Greek Evangelion, was a term used for the New Testament, or the four Gospel books in the New Testament. So seemingly, the Quran refers to that book, or those books that Christians have. The problem with that is that the Gospels, or the New Testament, are extremely in contradiction with Islam. Accepting those books in any form as true would immediately refute Islam. But that's another topic for a different time. I would like to look at common Muslim claims and see where they think in those books Muhammad was mentioned. The first, most popular claim is that Deuteronomy 18 clearly prophesies the coming of Muhammad. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him to. <laughs> I find this funny. Nowhere in this verse can we see a reference to Muhammad. It only says that God will send a prophet from among their brethren, the Israelites. This could be literally any prophet. Considering that this verse comes into existence at Moses' time, and numerous prophets came between these, it is a very far reach that this verse refers to Muhammad. But I'm just having fun right now, to be honest. This claim can be destroyed very simply if we just do what Muslims always ask us to do when we cite problematic Quran verses. Read in context. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear, according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, 
What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. What is happening here is that Moses is communicating with God, and at some point God starts speaking to the people, and the people cannot bear it. They are terrified, so they tell Moses to tell God not to speak to them directly, because they cannot handle God's speech. God then agrees to not speak to them directly, and to send a prophet to them, to the people of Moses, to the Israelites, who would communicate God's message for him. Muhammad is claimed to be an Ishmaelite, which means he was not even a descendant of Israelites. And the Arabs were a mix of all kinds of people, not Israelites. And the Quran clearly separates the sons of Israel, or the Israelites, from the Muslims. Muslims would like to draw parallels between Moses and Muhammad, and through wishful thinking, make it look like this was about Muhammad. But the assertion that this is about Muhammad is just very far-fetched, and a desperate attempt to prove the Quran right. Also, if we really want to play the Muslim game and take these verses as authority, then we should go a few verses further down. Because there it says that if a prophet presumes to speak in God's name, or speaks for other gods, so if a prophet is a false prophet, then he should be put to death. By this verse, they should have killed Muhammad too, who preached in the name of a god called Allah, not Yahweh which, by the way, is also everywhere ingrained in these verses. He claimed he was the final messenger, a concept that does not exist in Abrahamic religion. And he turned the Jewish law upside down and made false prophecies, a lot of them. Sorry, Muhammad should have been put to death. Another popular example is Isaiah 42. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, it talks about a servant of God whom he has chosen and whom he upholds. Many Muslims try to interpret this as referring to Muhammad by applying all kinds of new Islamic interpretations to a quite normal prophetic text. The chapter begins with, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. According to many Muslims, this is a reference to Muhammad. According to Christians, this is a prophecy about Jesus, since Jesus is the expected Messiah, and God, and the Son of God. According to Jews, this is simply about Israel or someone else. It is absurd to claim that this was about Muhammad, since the chapter says that he will go on until he establishes justice in the earth. Muhammad did not go on. He died and didn't bring justice to the world at all. Maybe he brought his justice in his own sense to most of the Arabian Peninsula and that's it. And that is hardly the world. And no, Islam will not bring justice to the world. Muslims usually go on and assert that poetic references to two places, Kedar and Salah in this chapter are references to places in Arabia, when that is simply historically not true, and a very poor attempt at twisting facts. But all of that aside, Isaiah is a book that is not part of the Torah, but that is a separate book of the prophets, containing prophecies by the prophet Isaiah. This is a book written by Isaiah, or on account of him, not revealed by Allah. And it is never mentioned in the Quran, which mentions the Torah revealed to Moses and the Gospel revealed to Jesus. In fact, the prophet Isaiah is not even mentioned in the Quran or the Hadith. He is fundamentally unknown to Islam. One more example that Muslims point at is in the New Testament, in John, chapter 6, where Jesus says, If I do not go away, then the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Or when he, the Spirit of Truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. Muslims try to play etymological games and claim that the word here, translated as helper, which in Greek is perikletos, was actually originally perikletos, which means famous, praiseworthy, which they claim is similar to Ahmed or Muhammad, which means this is actually what the Quran prophesied. But <laughs> it is extremely weird of Muslim apologists to try and assert that the Greek text of this very specific part, of this very specific gospel, of this very specific gospel verse, of this very specific chapter, was mysteriously corrupted and misunderstood by Christians. 
while Muslims also reject the entirety of this gospel and other gospels as corrupted, especially everything that contradicts Islam, which is too much in these gospels. But Muslim apologists desperately reinterpreting verses sounds familiar, doesn't it? <clears throat> Science. <clears throat> It was very hard to hear. In fact, the same matter, the helper who comes after Jesus, is also mentioned in John 14, and there it clearly refers to the Holy Spirit, a belief fundamental to Christianity. And on top of that, if we actually read John 16, and especially John 14, then we see that a Muslim should never accept these chapters as authoritative in any way, because they basically claim that Jesus is one with God, the Father explicitly and repeatedly mentioned here, that Christians can pray in Jesus' name, that seeing Jesus means seeing God. In fact, Jesus says right here in John 14, just a few verses before the one which Muslims claim prophesies Muhammad, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Islamically seen, this is pure blasphemy. <laughs> I could go on like this forever. The point is, Muhammad is not prophesied anywhere in these books, not in the Torah, not in the gospel that they have with them. Otherwise, Muslims wouldn't need to dig into these different books and twist the texts in order to find vague promises and prophecies that supposedly point at Muhammad without ever mentioning him or anything related to him. The whole coming of the final prophet, a final messenger, is also never mentioned anywhere in biblical scripture a final messenger whom everyone should follow. When the Quran asserts that Muhammad was indeed prophesied in those books, which is a claim that the Quran makes because it cannot explain how Muhammad fits into Abrahamic religion, and why in the world Jews would believe him, and why Christians would abandon their faith for Islam, then the Quran is entirely making up things out of thin air and is lying to us. It is false, and this disproves Islam. It destroys Islam. And who really wants to believe that these books were sent by Allah, that they contained completely different things, and they were somehow changed and corrupted by Jews and Christians? Somehow, it, that, that succeeded completely. Sure, that is such a dumb thing to believe. But thanks for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to like and to subscribe. Most of my videos are not monetized. If you want to support what I'm doing, you can consider supporting me on Patreon or on apostateprofit.com. I appreciate all your support very much. I will be back very soon. Have a fantastic day and stay away from Islam.